All right, so today we're going to continue our coverage on China. They seem to be having so much effect on the international trade, but also on the tech community. And we're going to dive in a little deeper about China, China's recent crackdown on some of the U.S. publicly traded companies. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to Tech Path. As you know, we've covered Didi on this show, which is basically the Chinese version of Uber. We've looked, of course, across the gambit on all of the Chinese electric uh, car companies, and we cover those in, in depth here. And I want to kind of jump to this story quickly on CNBC, which is really kind of the focus of, of today's video. It's going to talk a little bit about this. Should you be investing in Chinese publicly traded companies, or is there some great opportunity here, or are there some opportunities with maybe the U.S. alternatives? So um, we're going to dive into that today. But a little bit of this is Be Beijing stepping up its oversight on the flood of Chinese uh, listings in the U.S., which basically uh, are mostly tech companies. So State Council said rules oversees the listing as domestic enterprises will be updated while it's also tightening restrictions across the board. There's quite a bit going on here. The most powerful companies, including Didi, Alibaba, Tencent, are suddenly under immense scrutiny as the contra uh, basically the, contra uh, the country vows to crack down on these companies on U.S. exchanges and obviously how this affects U.S. American and American investors, really worldwide investors, because I think a lot of people trade on the U.S. stock market from around the world and are looking at these kinds of companies. So I wanted to get our, basically one of our analysts that I think is one of the best minds out there when it comes to China and some of the publicly traded companies. Joining me today is, of course, Mr. Taylor Ogan with Snowball Capital. Great to have you back on the show, Taylor. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Good yeah. To be here. So, Taylor, let's jump into this because this is this is a really one. The first time I saw it with Didi, it was literally like two days after you and I filmed a uh, the IPO release for Didi, and uh, a handful of days later, China comes in, slaps some restrictions not only on Didi from their app store, also along many other aspects. There's also been some recent news about China trying to organize with DD in terms of collecting of data. What's going on with uh, the People's Republic of China when it comes to their tech companies and especially around trading on the open market here in the US? So the first thing that, if you go back to October of 2020, Jack Ma gave uh, a talk where he criticized uh, some Chinese regulators. And a, a few weeks later, they came back and, and they started investigating Ant uh, group, which was yeah. looking to IPO soon. And uh, they basically shut that down. And then they went after Alibaba, the parent company and, uh, that Jack Ma was still affiliated with at the time. And obviously he founded Alibaba and they, uh, they, they slapped a, a hefty fine on Alibaba for antitrust violations. So that's that was the first thing that we knew about. No one really knew. Was that a Jack Ma thing? Was that a, a antitrust thing? What was this a bigger thing? Was this a data thing? And now the second thing that we've seen is this Didi, uh, what's happening with Didi. And no one, no one saw it coming. Uh, seriously, no one saw it coming, except Didi did kind of know about it. Uh, and they didn't, they, they did add it to their risk section, but uh, they didn't say that they were currently under investigation. They weren't actually under investigation, but they were told that they should hold off on uh, IPOing in the United States. And they chose not to. They had a two-day road show that is just yep. unheard of. Uh, so they really rushed it. And again, as we talked about last time, it was a small, it was a small IPO, actually. It was, mm -hmm. it was actually tied for their third largest cap raise in the company's history. Uh, so it wasn't really like they were doing it uh, for so much, uh, so much cash. I mean, it was, it was really, uh, no one really knows why they chose now and why they wanted to do it on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so we now know in retrospect that they were uh, being probed, and now there are seven agencies, we just learned this morning, uh, seven agencies from the Chinese government that are stationed inside of Didi, which is not very good. Uh, that's basically going to be, it seems to be very retaliatory. Does that change anything of DD of the company in the long run? No. In fact, it, it actually validates a lot of what we were saying last time and how right. important this data is. 
And and so this is also chi kind of China trying to say to the United States, hey, if you want to have our companies listed over there, uh, we don't trust that you're going to that you're going to just play nice. You may try to take all of their data like you are accusing our government of doing. So mm -hmm. there it's it's really a, a two way road here. And uh, so that's the story with with Didi. We can go into it a lot more. But it's what this is. This is creating already in just the, the week that we've we've heard about this, uh, this is creating a lot of disruption in where Chinese companies are listed. Yep. And, and so you can get into the VIE, the variable interest entity structure, the Cayman Islands and everything. Uh, a lot of companies that people in the United States and, and elsewhere outside of China know uh, are VIE companies. And right. that's how right. you're able to buy them so easily. But really, maybe some of the more exciting companies and safer companies uh, are are the companies that trade over the counter that are Chinese, and they they have the government has no issue. The Chinese government has no with, issue with those. Uh, and now you see the companies that are their primary listings are in China. Now they're even they're either doing dual primary listings, like we just saw last mm -hmm. week with Xiaopeng, yep. Yep. Uh, and now. And now other companies are, are trying to have at least secondary listings in Hong Kong. Um, that's going to be the trend. And there is a flood. And if it's too much of a flood, it's actually bad. But right now it's a flood. And just this morning, we, we see news of NEO. Uh, there's a probe there uh, with its secondary listing in Hong Kong. The, and by the way, the, the reason that people, that these companies, these Chinese companies have chosen the VIE route uh, basically having a shell company in the Cayman Islands, and that's your primary listing, uh, is, is that it's, it's a lot more, in the past, it's been a lot more difficult to meet the criteria of the Hong right. Kong Stock right. Exchange uh -huh. uh, than it is to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. And, and NASDAQ, I mean, even New York Stock Exchange, it's, you have to have half as much profit uh, for the past two years, and it's pre-tax. Uh, it, the, the criteria are, are a lot, uh, more lax, and and so companies have chosen to, and you get you get exposure to the U.S. capital markets. Now, what's a lot of people don't know is that all of these companies that their their primary listings or their only listings uh, were on the New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq. That meant that the their own customers in China could not invest in these companies. Mm -hmm. And so, the, while they wanted the the global capital that is kind of pushed through the, the United States. Uh, in our capital markets, now they're realizing that there is a lot more capital uh, that they can prosper off or off of uh, in in Hong Kong and right. by way of the Stock Connect. Now uh, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange and, and, and Shanghai can people in China can actually buy. Let's say you have a, a Xiaopeng car. In the past, you couldn't. You could buy. You bought the car, but you can't own the stock. Now you can own the stock and own the car. So that's the trend that is definitely going to be everyone shifting towards. Uh, and what that means for the companies that, that are still VIEs uh, in the United States, it's, it's really uncertain right now. So, okay, so the shift toward this really more, it looks at or appears that it, it kind of is, well, I think it's gonna have two different a place here because you've got, China, as in the government, actually pushing these tech companies into alternative strategies, hence the secondary market offerings, which is going to eventually affect NEO and many others, which will give them more of a global. How does this play into what China is doing with uh, the digital yuan? Because you've got so much structure being, inf being built around the digital yuan right now and what that means for China in general. Do you feel as though they're... I mean, it's almost like if you said, hey, we're, we're not going to allow U.S. companies to operate in China. If you can imagine Apple, Facebook, any of those types of companies, that mm -hmm. would basically destroy their balance sheets. I mean, that's a Tesla. Just look at, at the reliance on China uh, for the number of cars that they sell. Do you feel like there's more at play here in terms of the governments looking at potential conflicts down the road than it is more about controlling the tech itself? It's a very good question uh, because it would have been a different answer three weeks ago. If we just had the ant group uh, debacle to look at, then maybe it is a currency thing. Maybe it yeah. is is uh, also retaliatory, again, as I said, 
for, for what Jack Ma said. But uh, it now it seems to be, and we keep going back and forth, everyone keeps going back and forth on, is this, well, first of all, I think it's way overblown. Uh, so a lot of people think that, for example, Didi, that they just shut down the, the app and that no one, that the 41 million rides per day that, it, that they give, no one can do those anymore. The 15 million drivers that they have, no, all of those drivers are out of a job. Uh, it's No, it's just if you hadn't already downloaded the DD app, they were, they've temporarily removed it from the app store while they're doing this review uh, that should last about another month. And then pass that if they wanted to another 45 days beyond that. But uh, yeah, so that is overblown. I think a lot of investors are are just really really scared. Uh, it's I don't think it's it's we're we're seeing a huge discrepancy in valuation. And and so that's the first thing. I mean, right now DD I see DD as a 30 to 40 percent discount off of because of all this off of what it already was discounted when it went public. Uh, so it's you, you don't see these kinds of discounts and, and investors should be licking their lips, but also being very careful because this this stuff can change in an instant, as we've seen. So to answer your question, uh, the with the digital yuan, I, again, it, it would have been a different answer uh, three weeks ago. But now we're seeing that this could actually be uh, a data concern for the Chinese government. One of the concerns is that how DD is storing its data. Is it storing it? Some are saying that they're storing uh, some of their data and transmitting some of their data through Cisco products. So those are American made products, components. It's the same thing that we're saying to, to uh, China with Huawei products, right? And we're trying to get every other one of our allies to say the same. Uh, they're playing hardball and throwing it right back in the United States space. So it could be partly that. There also was that a lot of people are looking, pointing towards, was a 2015 blog that Didi did with, uh, I think, Xinhua News. And they thought it was just kind of free publicity for the government and for themselves. But they basically said for two summer days in, in the summer of 2015, they looked at the rides in Beijing and they saw where uh, government officials, what parts, what government parties were uh, basically busier at what times. And so, for example, the, the Department of Agriculture, uh, most of their rides didn't leave uh, that, that building until like 11 or 12 at night. And so that, but that was also, that coincided with, that was probably because of uh, a very, you know, it was the harvest season. And, and then they had the uh, Department of Education, not many rides because it was summer. And so they, they, they published this and they said, look how interesting this is. This is what we can do with our data. We can just see what parts of the government are popular at what different types of day. Now, if you look back on that as, as a government, and especially one in the, through the eyes of, of the Chinese government, and then right. how that could be, that kind of data could be, you know, if the Pentagon in the United States had that data, uh, that would be potentially, uh, you know, serious and they don't want that getting out. So now they haven't said that explicitly, but that's the kind of data that people didn't really realize that they may have. And now and we, we do think it's probably that because they are saying we don't want on the mapping side of, of the app. Uh, they're trying they, they're the Chinese government's concerned that they have labeled Chinese uh, military bases. And, and other government buildings. And so they yeah. would rather them just not have that. So it could be just as simple as that. It seems like it will be a, a quick fix. The good thing with, with Ant Group is that it, there, there has been a fix, right? And there's a solution. Uh, with Didi, I imagine the solution will come very soon and every, everyone will be right back on it. And they already are. And they're still giving probably 35 million rides per day right now, today. Uh, so it, there's really no change in, in DD on that front. Maybe they'll have to use uh, domestic servers or something. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I, I do think that it is more of a of a government data privacy concern and one that can be alleviated quite quickly. Yeah, in looking at a, a story, this was on CNN. Um, basically, it was just China's cracking down on private data privacy could be terrible news for some of their, you know, some of their tech companies uh, spent months clipping the wings of some of his tech champions over concerns of crowding competition. I like your angle a little bit better in the sense that they're probably more concerned about state secrets, uh, more so, especially with the mapping and geolocation. So I would say Didi is uh, at, at a little bit of risk here until they resolve what 
challenges they are going to have there. And, and my guess is that you're going to be dealing with uh, a government also who is very restrictive on their population, all the way from their social score, which is going to involve geo, you know, geo tracking their uh, individuals and their, um, you know, their population. In itself, uh, my guess is that we're probably going to see a lot more control and a lot more access to that data by uh, People's Republic of China and obviously the CCP. Where do you see this flowing over into some of these other companies, though? Because whether it's someone like a Neo, an Xpeng, uh, Li Auto, et cetera, that are all publicly traded companies, let's just stay in the EV marketplace. Do you see this having any effect on those companies and or those stocks ever being pushed or pressured to delist off of the New York Stock Exchange? Yeah, I do. I, th I think that investors are holding those, those shares uh, should be concerned. Uh, really, really any ADR. If you have, uh, uh, I mean, there are some EV companies that are structured much better. Uh, I would say BYD is probably the best structured. Its primary listing is in China. Then it has a secondary listing, it's H shares in Hong Kong. Through that, they have ADR, that's BYDDY. And, and then they also have BYDDF, which is direct one-to-one. From the Hong Kong stock, so those are ordinary shares, and uh, those are the better of, of the two to buy. But so that they they have no, they they just trade over the counter. They're not. They, there's no way that the U.S. could delist them. Uh, whereas the U.S. could delist Neo, Xiaopeng, uh, Li, and let's say and and Alibaba. Uh, they couldn't do it to Tencent. Tencent's also very well structured and, and protected in this sense. Uh, and so you, you would have. What I see, where I see some potential risk, is is in a name like like Neo. It doesn't have a backup. If it gets delisted, there's no backup. If now with Xiaopeng, if it gets delisted, it has a dual primary listing now, and so it could just bounce over to to its its Hong Kong listing, yeah. uh, and and it's pretty fine there. Now Neo is trying to is looking to have a secondary listing, and China wants companies, its companies, homegrown companies, to list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Sure. They, they, they do, they've said it outright. Uh, and so, and they also said that they'll they'll make it easier because again, in the past, it has been a, a more difficult process. You also have to abide by the Chinese accounting standards. Now, this may shock people, but the Chinese accounting standards are a lot more strict than the United States, a lot more. And so that it's very expensive. Uh, for a lot of these smaller companies. And so it, in the past, I, I understand why they've gone the VIE route. Right. And now it's kind of time to, to come home is, is what China is saying. And at least have the option to come home because also they want their own citizens to be able to invest in these companies. And they're their companies and they can't invest in them. So it makes sense. Uh, and But geopolitically, I don't actually see uh, much likelihood that that there will that the United States will outright delist uh, all of these companies at once you know maybe if, right. if there if there's some kind of huge accounting fraud uh, but they, they they're not just going to delist them for the for the sake of them being Chinese or them being in the battery space or the EV space uh, yeah. but that being said people are, are certainly scared of this investors are and that's why these a lot of these companies are taking taking a hit uh, and some of them are taking too much of a hit uh, so look at it as a discount. But uh, with with Alibaba, it already had earlier this year, late last year, uh, a secondary listing on Hong Kong. So it's safer. Uh, if you look at um, something like Weibo, or if you uh, look at Tencent Music, or if you if you look at uh, Li, right? They they're all looking now suddenly to. And by the way, Xiaopeng's timing was just just coincidental. Uh, it seems. Uh, but but yeah, if you if you look at uh, Xiaopeng, they uh, their their president uh, ran J.P. Morgan, the, all of the Asia division at J.P. Morgan, and his basically colleague at the time is now the CEO of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So it was kind of an experiment. Now Beijing, it's a, Beijing, it's a it's a company, not the city. Uh, it's a it's a genetics company. They did this last year, uh, a pretty similar uh, dual primary listing, and it was it was pretty successful. Now, Xiaopeng is really the second to do it, the first in the EV space. Neo doesn't seem to, to Neo's aiming to, to have a secondary. Again, you just need a backup. 
And if they don't have a backup, investors should be concerned. Now, going forward, if investors want to be exposed to Chinese companies and their portfolios, uh, I think they, sh they, sh they certainly should. And you, the thing is, you, if you aren't actively paying attention to what's happening, but you still have exposure to Chinese names, you obviously, right, especially as we're seeing right now, you're at higher risk of losing your shirt. But at the same time, if you aren't in a lot of these Chinese names, then it's, I'd say it's almost worse because you're missing out on so many of these opportunities that you just can't have in the United States uh, from some of these traditional companies. I mean, they're, they're relatively boring stocks, the, the Apples, the Walmarts, the J&Js, the Chipotle, the AMD. Right. You, know, you have these investors who are, they're all, they're obsessed with Facebook. That's their, that's their, uh, you know, their, te their one tech company that they own. And, but you think that those are going to, to grow by three or four X in the next right. five years? Or do you think that some of these smaller Chinese companies, then they're not smaller in terms of their multi active users by any means, uh, but in terms of their market caps, uh, who is more likely to, to grow faster? So if you're okay with you know, living off dividends, then fine. But if you wanna be in China, you have to pay attention and, and it's difficult. And that's why th there are not many companies or firms that, that follow it closely. The ones that do are over in China right now. And that's why, I mean, our company is moving to China because we can't, it's just too difficult to do from the, right. the United States. Uh, and so we have to live there, right? So, but you, you have to be exposed to these, but you have to be paying attention. And I, I will say it's difficult to pay attention to and follow a lot of this, especially if you don't speak the language, uh, but it is doable. And I'd say it's more fun and, and it's going to pay off if, if you are paying attention. So yeah. there are some really exciting names and there are opportunities that are over there that are through these same VIE companies, structured companies. So like Neo, it doesn't mean that Neo is a bad company, just you can breathe easier once it's listed over there. Same with Lee, same with, there are, there are over a hundred of these VIE companies. If you so look once at a chart, they move over there. Yeah, if you look yeah. at a chart here, uh, we're just gonna take a quick look here. This is of course, Neo, uh, DD, we've got on the low gold line right there, obviously just recently listed, uh, Xpong, and then Lee Auto right there, all of which are in terms of percentage are downtrending right now uh, across this. So what you're saying, Taylor, is that this is, depending on how closely you follow China and their moves in general, this is potentially a buying opportunity for a, a risk adverse, uh, or I should say a risk tolerant <laughs> investor mm -hmm. who's looking to try to, to really gain some, uh, some big moves here. Because once DD gets the go, this stock is going to jump again. Uh, this is going to be one of those that's just absolutely going to uh, going to move. Neo, if they get a secondary listing, that in essence I think softens the potential, and would give them a little bit of bump back to where they've been going. When you look at their, let's take a look at their um, year to date. Neo, so yeah, they had their all time. Yeah, it looks like they had their all time back in early February. So there's a potential there for some a little bit of movement but obviously it's not like what we've seen back in march and april where these stocks were at a much lower trading um you know trading right. uh price so if you look at all of this in in terms of what's happening in china and then you come back to where especially your your group because you guys study china day in day out and where the plays are, obviously BYD is. I, we, you know, we tout that pro that product here on this show because we just believe in what that company is doing. But um, if you look at that and some of these OTC products that are coming out of China, where would be the safe bet right now? I mean, where would where would an investor say, I, I do want to dabble in in some Chinese uh, tech stocks and kind of the evolution of where these EV markets are going? But where would be the safer bet? So it, that's also a really good question uh, because we are thinking the same way of we literally had on the whiteboard yesterday two columns, the at-risk companies and, and the, the safer uh, companies. And the way that I look at it, it's, it's really in two parts and minus the financials and everything. But if, if you're already looking at these companies or let's say you already held all these companies uh, and you have to really split them up, one, one criteria is you, I would say you have to look at which companies are at risk for, through the eyes of the government, 
for potentially uh, if their data were to get into the wrong hands. And it's actually a fun exercise to do uh, because you really have to think of the implications that all of these companies have. And you may realize that they're, they're a lot better than from a data perspective than you may, may have realized in the past. Uh, but if, if you then look at, uh, and then the second criteria would be if they have basically a crazy CEO or, or founder that would say something like Jack Ma. And really, there's only one Jack Ma uh, in, in China. Uh, but in the United States, you have Elon Musk and, and hey, maybe Elon Musk says the wrong thing sometimes or, or offends the Chinese government. That, then that's that that would be horrible. Uh, so he has to play his cards right. But so those, those two things are those two criteria are important. So the, the companies that I would say are are on the safer side are actually the electric vehicle companies, uh, the companies like Meituan Dianping, the company uh, Xiaomi, uh, some of those Tencent, right? If that, if all of their data got into the wrong hands, now Tencent, you can go back and forth, but they're so big and they they invest so much in uh, in their IT infrastructure that I think they're they're very safe and they've been at this game for longer than almost any other tech company in China. So that's that's one thing that that I would I would say. I, I would also say a, a relative, and that's not invest uh, investment advice, but a relatively safer play would actually be the electric vehicle space in China. Uh, I mean, earlier this year, there, there was that, or sorry, earlier this week, uh, Monday or Tuesday, there was that uh, surprise uh, uh, you know, announcement that China's bank reserve ratio was cut. So these liquidity sensitive growth stocks, they that investors should start, especially investors that are able to ha you know, have a need, that have a greater tolerance for higher valuations, uh, they they should be looking at these elect these Chinese electric vehicle stocks a lot closer uh, because it is a buying opportunity you could say, and and now if especially if their own people can buy into these stocks as well, uh, that promotes these these companies the same way that you see Tesla on Twitter. You know if you have you don't have those those types of diehard fans that maybe they really love the product but they're not going to maybe quit their job and and really just promote you know, the, the stock like crazy, like you, you see with, with, uh, with Tesla, you even see that with Neo in the United mm -hmm. States. You don't see that with sure. Neo uh, in, in China. So now what's that going to look like? And it'll be fun to follow. And now we're going to get a lot more information from these companies. If the Chinese people who live and breathe and drive these cars every day, if they're posting these very favorable, favorable things, then it's going to look. It's going to be a very interesting landscape, I'd say. Uh, yeah. And 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 you better bet that they'll be all over Twitter too. So that's going to be fun. Um, but you. So it's it's yeah. Well, the, but the the big thing about the EV space in China, especially right now, in terms of of how safe it is with the government in the government's eyes. Remember, Beijing's goal for EVs are to account for 20% of new vehicles sold in 2025. And then carbon neutrality is a very ambitious goal of carbon neutrality in 2060. So what it's they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot there. And and also the Chinese government at no point has has tried to punish uh, investors in any of these these names. They're trying mm -hmm. to punish the name, the companies themselves. And so they, they want to protect investors as much as they can. Uh, so they also want to to clean their environment. Uh, and, and there's one of the very easy and direct ways they can do that is through the promotion of new energy vehicles. Right. So I think that relative some, to some of the other names uh, in China, the Chinese electric vehicle stocks are a safer bet. I want to jump to this piece here, weigh the risk of owning ADRs, at least 248 Chinese companies listed on uh, three major U.S. exchanges, market caps of around $2.1 trillion on this. Uh, then you look at China's ETF model here. How does this play into it? And do you think that a lot of these companies that are non-tech are really kind of out of the worry zone uh, from an investor standpoint? They, they're not, they won't be, uh, I don't think ever, as long as the United States and China are dueling like, like right. we are. Yeah. Uh, you all, there's always a risk associated there. Uh, the, the ADRs, I mean, again, they, they represent shares of a stock that trades on on a foreign exchange, mm -hmm. and so they, that's that's kind of you know it. 
there is some protection there, you could you could argue, of course, but at the same time, it's the American version of right. The, right. the actual Chinese stocks. And at at any point, you know, and the other thing is, what what if China, I, I really would see more of a risk of China just saying, hey, we do not support the VIE structure. Mm -hmm. And we would rather, instead of the Cayman Islands, we'd rather have our homegrown companies, uh, you know, in China. And they could just pull the plug pretty much. I think that's a higher risk than, Interesting. than maybe say the, the United States delisting for sure. Yeah. So uh, ADRs are at, at just as much of a risk there. Uh, if you, I think that investors, if you can, uh, and you want to be into these Chinese names, no matter what the name is, you should buy the the Hong Kong version uh, because you know, and it depends on your broker, but uh, and they and they trade in, in higher lots and everything. Uh, and but it's they're not just for liquidity purposes and volatility purposes, but uh, just for for the absolute uh, you know Certainty. you're de-risking as yeah. much as you can, right? <laughs> so it's I I mean I wouldn't own any of these. Let's say let's say you could own Alibaba trading as Baba on right. New York Stock Exchange, or you could own Alibaba trading on the Hong Kong Exchange secondary. Uh, I would own that one. And, mm. and I do. So I, I, it's just it's it's too much risk right now. Uh, so but if they don't have a backup, you really have to be careful. And until yeah, they get a backup, sure. and then that's about three months away, they say they're, they're making it easier for a secondary. Now, to have a primary still in Hong Kong, it's pretty strict uh, and and it's also very expensive. Um, but that takes about nine months, eight to nine months. And they'll probably make that easier. But, uh, yeah, a lot of these companies are in the next three months. You, you'll be able to breathe a lot easier. Yeah, I think the key here and the message to our uh, viewers, listeners, is that you know if you are investing in a lot of these companies, whether it's EV, tech, et cetera, that are Chinese-based, especially with Didi kind of as the poster child recently from an IPO standard, is that you, you've got to be able to follow this as closely as possible because these moves are happening pretty quick. I mean, just the fact that China, one, as a country can move so quickly uh, because they literally do not have a, you know the governance, you know structure that we have here in terms of the the Senate and the House. Those kind of things, our laws and ability to restrict these kind of things, much slower. China is a, a completely different organization in terms of uh, how they make decisions and how quick they can affect markets and really kind of move things. Which I've been just amazed at how fast they've been able to get the digital yuan tested and moving so yeah. fastly. I mean, so fast into the society. Uh, obviously, I know they're racing to try to get that done before the Olympics and because that's going to be the mm -hmm. poster child of the digital yuan for the world coming to China for the first time. You're going to see this coming out. And I think at that point, wow, there's going to be some very interesting things happening in the next uh, 24 months uh, when it relates to China for that. That's for sure, Taylor. Certainly. And, and one thing I, I want to say is that I... I can probably imagine that there there may be some of your viewers who are saying if if they do own Chinese companies, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to sell them all, and and I don't want to have to worry about that. Or or yeah, this is this is exactly why I never own Chinese uh, companies. Or right. you know, there there are always going to be those people, and and to those people, I say have fun with your Snapchats and your Facebook stocks. If you really, again, want the serious growth, you have to be there, just pay attention. I mean, yeah. even if it's not your full-time job, you can do this. And and it's it's kind of difficult, uh, no matter, you know, depending on how how much you want to risk there, but uh, the, the risk reward is, is, is obviously incredible over there. And it's just, I do not see the same excitement in tech names, at least, in the United States or, or yeah. anywhere else. It's not like Europe yeah. has, has you know, better tech names than even the United States. Uh, so it's all over in China. And again, you just have to pay attention. Uh, Taylor, I want to jump to another topic and that is uh, charging networks. If you look at China and what they've been able to do with their own state-owned charging network, but also some of these, you know, a variety of the their small upstart companies that have really kind of flowed into that. The reason I, I want to bring this up is the impact potentially here on charging companies in the US, one on how they go to market, how they're gonna basically do their build outs, whether you're looking at ChargePoint, Blink, you know, et cetera, um, Electrify America, all, all those that essentially are really going after the US market. 
Talk to me about why China and how China has gone and done the rollout that they've been able to do. Obviously, they have a bigger adoption rate right now on EVs, but more, more importantly is how were they able to get this infrastructure in place so, so quickly? Because, you know, the rate in which EVs are being adopted there is unbelievable in comparison to the U.S., even in comparison to Europe. Yeah, it, it's well, first of all, it's China's speed. So they, they do things a lot faster over there. And they have a government that actually supports uh, the electrification of vehicle fleets. Uh, whereas that's a fairly new thing for the United States. And right. so you you have, the other thing is that China is not a sprawling country in terms of suburbia, like the United States. So we, mm -hmm. if you look at a, a map of, of uh, Electrify America or Tesla superchargers, they're along the big interstates and they're not in cities. And if they are, then they're the urban chargers or the level two chargers. Uh, but the DC fast level three chargers are along the corridors that connects right. the whole country. And, and I've, yep. I've been in, in my Tesla, I've gone from Boston to San Francisco, down to LA, through New Orleans, and all the way back up through DC and back up to Boston, uh, relying only on Tesla's supercharging network. Uh, and I did that four years ago. So the, the charging infrastructure exists for, for those types of things. And granted, it was a little bit more difficult back then uh, than it certainly would be now. Uh, but that's connecting the country. Whereas in China, a lot of cars, let's say you, you have a car in Beijing, you can't drive that car in Shanghai necessarily. Uh, you, and so you, you're, you're kind of limited. And so if you look at, and people should pull up, I don't know if you can pull up a map of even Tesla's superchargers uh, in China versus Europe, or, or the United States, uh, it's they're, they're in cities. All the superchargers are just packed into the cities. Mm -hmm. And that's because a lot of people at home cannot charge or in their apartment buildings cannot charge their cars. So what they do is they have to find a time, a lot of them charge once or twice a week uh, when they have some time off and they just go and charge their car uh, and it's not overnight. So they're actually in their car a lot. Uh, and so that's something that, that in, China, it's very different. It's a different landscape than uh, than in the United States. Let That's the first some, thing. Yeah, let sure. me give you some stats here. China installed 284,000 public EV charging outlets in 2020. Uh, yeah. 112,000 in December alone, and they're up to like 4,000 a day in December for public charging stations at that rate, obviously with the adoption rate, the continuous, are there any opportunities there in terms of these smaller companies that are moving into the charging space? Because there is a report also that shows a large percentage of these chargers are one, either not operational fully, they've got some problems with you know defective charging outlets. Hey, I run into that all the time here in our own network in the US where you know I just was on a trip this week. Granted, we stopped into some of the newer places, but even some of the Tesla chargers were out of order. Um, so I guess volume matters, but how, are there any of these emerging companies that could kind of come in and, and give more of a premium product or a premium service? Yeah, I would look at, I wouldn't look at so much, so much the specific names, uh, because I don't know if, how they're going to translate over here. Uh, but I would look to China for, uh, in terms not just the United States but globally, for the different types of charging that China is, has been experimenting with. And so yeah. that would be battery, battery swapping, battery stations, swapping, sure. Uh, that that Neo is doing, uh, and a few others, uh, maybe wireless charging. Um, and, and even as we get into this and have more infrastructure on the roads, uh, charging lanes, and there are even some companies that, uh, charge through, a drone flies up and, and, uh, connects you to, uh, to, um, the way that like buses and trolleys, uh, operate. So th there are a lot of different technologies and they're all being tested in either Norway or China. And, and so China, they are, they're showing the feasibility of some of these new technologies. So battery swapping is one that I, I, I've been following very closely. Uh, and I don't know if that would do well in the United States. Uh, you also kind of have to have a battery leasing model because otherwise you're just swapping out your battery pack for mm -hmm. one that you don't know much about and you don't know how many cycles it has left on it and everything. Right. Uh, so if that's more of if a company could adopt that, Tesla, remember, did try to 
do that. They even gave a presentation on how it's almost faster than filling up your gas tank. Uh, but they abandoned that years ago. And so, but battery swapping, it may be making its way to the United States. That's a technology that if you, if you, ha if you can find a company that is bringing that technology that is quite proven. And I've been against battery swapping actually for, for many years and I've, I've been converted, I'd say. Uh, but, but if you can find a company that is, do, is bringing battery swapping to the United States, that could potentially be a winner. Uh, if you, there are some of these companies that are doing uh, some wireless charging at malls, uh, some wireless charging in apartment buildings where you just drive over it. There are names in the United States and we've met with a lot of them. And that's more for buses, uh, for utility vehicles. I wouldn't really see that. I don't know how many people are that lazy that they can't plug their their car in. Uh, but if you're if you have like a, a rapid bus transit system, you know, loop, and they're making stops uh, four times a mile for 35 seconds each time, that's a little bit of of wireless charging energy that you can you can recuperate from that. So some of those companies are more exciting. But again, I wouldn't look at the specific names. And the, yeah. the last thing on charging in China is that it is a lot state owned uh, and and grid grid owned. So the grid wants to have these charging stations. And uh, in the United States, our grid is all messed up. Uh, so they, they, our grid's not even thinking that way. But in China, a lot of most of the chargers are from these these utility companies. And that's because they want to balance and uh, how how much energy and what parts of the city uh, are being utilized uh, and and so that they can better balance their grid. So Do you think this will have any effect though? Yeah, do you think this growth, though, that China is experiencing with their charging networks is going to have any effect on a lot of these stocks and these companies that are trying to essentially build out the charging networks here in the U.S.? Obviously, with the scenario of, of uh, swappable batteries, that's still yet to be proven, at least here in the U.S. We have a lot of people that, you know, absolutely don't believe that's going to be a thing. And we've even had the, you know, the swappable battery guys uh, on our show here. Um, and we've talked about this. I'm still a little bit speculative as to whether or not that's capable because of the build outs, things of that nature. But do you think all of this growth in China in terms of EV adoption, batteries, or the battery network, we'll call it, being built out so aggressively, do you think that's going to put any pressure on Biden and the administration here in the U.S. to really ramp up the infrastructure? Because this is the problem. This is the problem that I've, I've pointed out all along. For adoption to take place at any kind of double-digit scale, you got to have a charging network in place. I mean, I was on my way. Granted, I, I drove to Orlando the other day, and I did three stops in um, in 400 and you know 25 miles. You know, it's a Tesla. Sure, you get a little bit more, but that was a little bit inconvenient on one. If I would have preferred it had been a two-stop. First time I did a round trip in one day. So I think just that infrastructure, being able to, because I had to, we missed a spot. And it was like, luckily, there was one that was another 30 miles south. Yeah. But man, you missed that one. And wow, you now you're in trouble. Right. So I, the interesting thing about what China is doing is that I would say they've they've accelerated faster than their own government anticipated. And that means than anyone else anticipated, because no one else right. ever thinks that the Chinese government can accomplish anything, even though they do every time. So they they actually they did install significantly more chargers than they than they uh, uh, ever anticipated by this point already. So now that there are so many chargers in China, I would actually say that that a lot of the electric vehicle manufacturers are looking at this and saying this range anxiety that you just described, Paul, mm -hmm. is yep. not maybe it, it's it's been alleviated it by China and Chinese consumers significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so that means that people don't the companies don't need to have a 500 mile range car if there are chargers everywhere and you don't have yeah. to wait in lines. Right. Got, now I'm wait, waiting in lines, Tesla lines all the time. And it's really frustrating. Uh, and especially if they I don't want Tesla to open that up because I'm selfish, but uh, they probably should. I don't know. Uh, but you know, no one wants to wait in lines. And so if you just have an abundance of these chargers, then the you don't need to have a 500 mile range car. So in I would say that that's what the EV makers are looking at. Now, in terms of the consumer facing point of view, let's say we have the Ford F-150 Lightning. 
lot, those are going to be a lot of first time EV owners and they're going to need a sufficient uh, charging network, network yep. that they they're going to be thinking all types of things Because everyone when they're a first time EV buyer, they're thinking they're that's why it's called range anxiety. They're very anxious about if they can get to this place and they learn and, oh, if I have my AC cranked up too high or my heater on or the heated seats or should I open the, the, the window? You know, I've tinkered with that as, as much as possible. <laughs> and but if you just have all the charging stations to begin with that, that you could ever need, then that's that's a lot better and a lot. It's going to lead to a lot higher adoption rates. Yeah. And that's that's what the Biden administration is certainly looking at. Uh, so I, I think that it will be a priority for them. And it's the, the good thing about uh, EV charging stations, even level threes, are that you can build those out and scale them quite quickly. You can't do that with batteries. And there are no American right. companies that are making electric vehicle batteries. And no, Tesla's not making batteries yet. So, you know, it's you, you, you have to the, the charging thing is easy for the United States. And I think that, they, that the United States will scale very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and but in in China they're already they're already scaling and and again it's just putting more of these these stations in cities rather than in between uh, cities and provinces. Right. I feel like there is a race going right now when you look at the major you know titans in terms of where EV adoption is going. Obviously China has a massive lead on the U.S. but the U.S. of course is in its first really its infancy in terms of adoption. And also now the support from the government, the federal government, to roll out an infrastructure that really can kind of attack this. Hopefully this is going to give you people that are out there watching and listening to this show, you know, some confidence in some of these charging companies that are really developing here in the U.S. Because I think when you look at the global stage, China is really the number one country out there when it comes to electrification and their models are going to be the ones that I think the world follows in most cases in terms of how do we ramp up, how quickly do we look at the alternatives, what kind of systems do we need to get in place, the processes and, and models in which we would move them out, where we would put them. All those kind of things I think is uh, going to be very interesting to watch in the coming years. Anything, when you look at any of these um, these American companies or the uh, companies that are traded here on the U.S. stock exchanges, from a charging network, do you have one that you like any better than others? So to be honest, I think uh, every single one of them is is overvalued. Uh, really? I don't right. think, yeah. Even um, at the current stock but, prices, because some of these prices are really down now. Yeah, they, they are down relative to already being extremely overvalued. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of, of any of the names that that I've looked into in that space. It doesn't mean that it's not a space that investors should be looking at though. Uh, it's, it's just that it's, it's also very difficult to see what's happening in China and then to still be excited at the progress that is happening sure. in the United States, if that yeah. makes sense. So uh, yeah, we're, we're just not uh, in any, any uh, US names in that space. Um, but you, you may know that space uh, much better than I. Well, we're watching it very closely, and we're going to be doing a, a piece on ChargePoint, which is a little bit deeper. We've had Electrify America on. I mean, they seem to be very confident about where they're growing. Uh, Blink, which, of course, is here in Miami uh, near our studios and just not too far away, but they a little bit slower. We've had Volta on with their strategy. I mean, there is there are quite a few innovations happening in the segment. Yep. I think the question is whether or not you're matching adoption, again, with a lot of the rollouts, I think a Ford F-150, if they can build at scale, because it, it, that's really what it boils down to. It's There has been no U.S. company yet uh, that outside Tesla that has been able to build any electric vehicle at scale, including Ford and GM to a certain extent. I think the Bolt to a certain extent has done some scalable operations in terms of number of volume, but not near uh, anything that would uh, dent the idea of, um, you know, we need adoption and we need charging station kind of scenarios. Because right now, I think a lot of people would look at it and say, hey, we've got enough for what we have on the, on the road today, probably more. But the idea is that we need to double digit that inside five years. And that's the problem is getting the infrastructure to keep up with that pace. So Taylor Ogan, it's always uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for stopping in today. Uh, definitely want to catch you next time, especially as what China is doing in terms of these tech companies. This is going to be a very interesting uh, thing to watch for sure. But thanks for stopping in. Thanks so much, Paul. Always fun. 
All right, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in there. And of course, if you're here on YouTube, make sure and subscribe to the show. Hit the like button, and that's the number one thing you can do to help us out. And of course, share the video with someone you think uh, might be interested in some of these tech products out there. Of course, if you want to reach me, I leave my DMs open on Twitter, so just hit me up there, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on Tech Path.